We are excited today because today we will be talking about the House Bill 129 relating to juvenile justice and we have special guests that are going to comment on that House Bill. Today we have Representative Daryl Roussan from the 70th District. Uh, he is with us today. We also have the public defender Julie Holt from Tampa we, and we have Megan Newcomb who is the Juvenile Justice Chief at the State Attorney's Office in Tampa. Welcome. Glad to have you all here. All right, we're going to get started with Representative Daryl Roussan. Representative, tell us a little bit about, just give us a quick overview um, of the bill HB 129 relating to juvenile justice. We know that you are a co-sponsor. Now, we understand you actually didn't draft the bill yourself, but uh, just give us just a little idea of what the bill is all about. Well, the, the basic tenet of the bill is to create a system where we can have juveniles adjudicated uh, or prosecuted in juvenile court as opposed to adult court um, and to set out some statutory standards that are not contained in the statute now for when that's appropriate. Also to allow, and unfortunately it was taken out at the first committee stop in the House, an opportunity for a judge to have a hearing to determine whether or not that case should remain in juvenile court as opposed to going to adult court. Uh, in juvenile court, we look at the best interest of the child. Uh, in adult court, uh, and it's rehabilitative, in adult court, it's punitive, and it's looking at the best interest of the public. And those are two different standards, and we want to be very careful when we look to prosecute juveniles. Correct, and the specific portion that we're going to talk about today is the reverse waiver portion that did not pass the first subcommittee in the House. Um, in fact, as far as I understand, there's three subcommittees this bill is supposed to pass through, the Criminal Justice Subcommittee, the Justice Appropri Appropriations Subcommittee, as well as the Judiciary Committee. And so in the Justice Criminal uh, Subcommittee, there was uh, an issue or an amendment made to the reverse waiver and that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, Ms. Holt, can you give me uh, what your opinion is and idea about this reverse waiver and uh, do you have any reasons as to why you think it was amended in the first subcommittee in the House? Well, the Senate bill that is the companion to the House bill continues to include that particular provision. It is my understanding that Representative Edwards, who is the main sponsor of this bill, was contacted by numerous individuals from the state attorney's office and from law enforcement asking for that particular provision to perhaps be deleted. And if that provision was deleted, the bill could pass through the committee, move on to the other two committees, and perhaps we could sit down with all the stakeholders again and try to work through this process. As the public defender as well as the president of the Florida Public Defender Association, uh, I am in favor of either a judicial waiver at the front end in the juvenile court itself or the reverse waiver um, applicability once we get to adult court. And there's many reasons to do that and I'm sure we're going to get into that in a few minutes. But primarily what we're trying to do is point out that across the state of Florida, what has happened is that it appears that as different state attorneys apply the direct file statute right now, what you're seeing is disparity as it relates to children that are similarly placed with similar charges. And although each of those state attorneys are individually elected, the reality of it is is that those of us that are in, in the position to affect policy, what we should do is look for those opportunities that we have to ensure that disparity doesn't occur, that we don't have criminal justice by zip code, and that we find a way to try to implement safeguards in the system in order to avoid quite often unintended consequences of bills that have been passed. And I think this is, a, this is one of those things where yes, the prosecutor has the discretion. What we're asking for is let the judges be that second set of eyes that looks at is this the appropriate child with the appropriate case that should in fact belong in the adult system or should we have the opportunity to return back to the juvenile justice system. It's just having a second set of eyes to look at this situation. And, and to underscore that point, yes, Representative. even though there are three ways a juvenile gets to adult court, 98% of the time they get there through direct file. 
the other two ways require some objective, independent uh, grand jury indictment or judicial waiver to get the child there. So we want to look at this huge area of discretion and apply some standards to it. Uh, I heard someone say that you have to look at the brain of children, of teenagers, when they're committing these offenses. And research shows us that uh, a, ch a teenager's brain is like a car with a good accelerator, but with weak brakes. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep that into consideration. Now, I also understand that from this reverse waiver portion that was taken out of the House bill, there were four criteria to um, decide whether or not the juvenile should be direct filed into adult court. The first criteria was the seriousness of the offense. The second is the extent of the child's participation. The third is the maturity of the child. And the fourth is if the child had any prior offenses. Now let's go to Ms. Newcomb right now and let's hear from her. Uh, Ms. Newcomb, you're the chief of the uh, state attorney's office in Tampa and what is your opinion about the reverse waiver portion that was taken out of the House bill and uh, is still in the Senate bill give us your opinion on that thank you Nina um, thank you for having me sure my opinion on the reverse waiver is that it is an unnecessary uh, change to the law and I support um, that it's taken out of the House bill um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about and I'd be interested in hearing uh, Representative Rousson and Ms. Holt's opinions about this, you know, the, the role of a prosecutor historically has been to make charging decisions and the way that it operates in my office is any child that is eligible for direct file, we review that case um, on an individual case-by-case -case basis and we look at numerous factors, not just four factors. We look at the child's age, the history, the seriousness of the crime, the impact of the crime on the community, um, whether it's a violent crime or not, whether the child has been involved previously in the juvenile justice system, what type of treatment have they received, what type of mental health issues, family issues that child has. So those are things that um, prosecutors all over the state of Florida are doing on an every single day basis, on, an, on a case by case basis for each juvenile that is eligible for direct file under the current law. So having a waiver procedure for a judge to look at that, in my opinion, um, a judge is not historically or in our justice system the party that makes charging decisions. Prosecutors are uh, the player that make charging decisions and we have a duty, an ethical duty and a statutory duty to seek justice, not just to prosecute everyone that the police arrest or charge, but to seek justice and part of seeking justice is looking at any defendant and especially a juvenile as a whole person and looking at whether or not keeping that child in the juvenile justice system will serve the child and the community or whether putting him in the adult system will better serve both the child and the community. So that's the primary reason why the state attorney's office in Tampa, the 13th Circuit, is against uh, specifically the reverse waiver provision. Uh, so, Ms. Hall, let's, let's hear from you, um, from Ms. Newcomb's uh, observations and, and her opinion. She's stating that it is not, uh, it is the state attorney's um, job, really, to decide whether or not uh, a case should be direct filed into the adult system and not the judge or the judges. What's your opinion on that? Well, I think uh, a couple of observations. First of all, when the direct, direct file statute was created, in fact, what it did was it impacted a longstanding uh, system that already existed in the juvenile justice system. Judges were given that authority initially to decide should this child be eligible for this direct file into the adult system. That was changed. And one of the reasons that it was changed, as, as best as I recall, was because the state attorney felt that they had to file a petition one way or the other in the, in the juvenile justice system so quickly that sometimes they didn't really have an opportunity to, to learn a lot about the child. And so they had to make their decision and they needed to do what they thought was in, in the public safety and in their, in their discretion what they thought was appropriate. So they would wave children over into the adult system because they didn't feel that they had enough information in their, in their hands at the time to perhaps warrant keeping the child in the juvenile justice system. The reverse waiver will allow you to make your decision, use your discretion as the state attorney. You can file against the child and, and put him into the adult system, but it then gives the child and the child's attorney an opportunity to say to the judge, here's all the information we now have. 
uh, it allows us to put it in, into the record not only through our words as lawyers or through the words of our, our perhaps our client, but it allows us an opportunity to hire experts that perhaps can discuss the maturity of this particular child. Whether or not the treatment that they've received in the past was valid or not valid, uh, was it really meeting the needs of the child or was it just one of these things where you say, uh, get evaluated and get treatment. So one of the things is it's a much more fair system if you allow the, the reverse waiver. I also think it's important for us to, to recognize that the criminal justice system has, has to be fluid. You have to take a look at what the consequences of passing particular laws are. Uh, there isn't any attempt at all through juvenile reform right now to stop the, the ability of a prosecutor to use their discretion and direct file. We're just asking for, let's have a balanced approach. Then let the defendant convince the judge, if appropriate, that they should belong in the juvenile justice system. I think the other thing that's important for us to recognize is you still have to look at the big picture. And although I live in the 13th Circuit and I work with Ms. Newcomb on a, on a daily basis on many issues, you cannot get away from the fact of the disparity across the, across the state of Florida. And, and we are obliged to respond to that as policy uh, individuals, as leaders. We just can't ignore it. Uh, you can't say I'm okay here in the 13th Circuit or not. We, we work closely with Ms. Newcomb in this area. Mm -hmm. We've made tremendous, tremendous strides, in my opinion, in the 13th Circuit, but we believe that there is still room for more opportunity. Reasonable people can have different opinions, and that's going to happen between us, and that's why we think there's a good, objective person when you, when you look at a judge. Two areas, two areas where the legislature has agreed that sometimes a prosecutor perhaps needs to be, perhaps their, their opinions need to be checked. Mm -hmm. One of them is drug court, and the other one is veterans court. And it's because sometimes public safety tends to override that other obligation that we have to take a look at vulnerable individuals that have been put into the into the criminal justice system because of their circumstances. So I believe that there is precedent uh, with the legislator saying, you can have your discretion. There's nothing wrong with having a second set of eyes, and that's all we're asking for. Re I'm, I'm going to get right to you. I've got a question, so um, it's directed towards you. Representative, your thoughts as well about this, and, and tell us a little bit, too, about your experience. You've practiced in the juvenile uh, system with those that have been direct filed to adult court. What's your opinion as well on whether or not it should be the judge's discretion as to whether or not the juvenile should be placed back in uh, juvenile court? What's well, your opinion on that? Issue of discretion is what we're questioning. Um, we know that it's the authority, the discretionary power of prosecutors to charge, what to charge based on the facts brought before them and how to prosecute a case. The check and balance on that is the electorate if a prosecutor is not acting appropriately. Um, but why should it be 98% of the time direct file? as opposed to an ideal situation of one-third by indictment, one-third by judicial waiver, and one-third by prosecutorial discretion. Uh, what prosecutor wants to lose discretion? Just ask the judges. When the legislature decided that sentencing guidelines should come into play and remove discretion from judges, they didn't like that, and they still don't like that. Families against mandatory minimums are always screaming about mandatory sentences set down by legislature. What this bill seeks to do is, like uh, Public Defender Holt says, bring a little balance to it. Bring a little more objectivity to it, a little more clarity in when a person can expect to be in adult court as opposed to juvenile court. And also recognize the level of education, the level of maturity, the level of impulsiveness that sometimes go with juvenile behavior. So uh, I'm in favor uh, of this bill. I wish the, the waiver, reverse waiver had not been taken out, but it's still a long way to go in the legislative process. I'm the ranking Democrat, and I have been for the last six years on the Justice Appropriations Committee in the Florida House, so I will get to vote on this bill very shortly, uh, first week of session when we next meet. And then we'll have one more committee, and then we'll get to vote on it again for it on the House. Miss Newcomb.
Ms. Newcomb, okay, so you've had the opportunity to listen to uh, both of the opinions. What What is your opinion on the information that you had stated that as a state attorney that you have information to decide various types of different information as to whether or not you feel that the child should be direct filed in adult court? Do you feel as though you have uh, sufficient enough information to make that decision? And what are your responses to the opinions that have just been stated? Yes, I would like to respond to a few things. Sure. Um, do I feel that as a prosecutor, I always have enough information to make a filing decision? Um, no, you have to make decisions with the information that you have and use the best information that you have at the time. Um, a couple of things that Ms. Holt said that I want to address, um, talking about treating um, kids or defendants the same throughout the state. You know, my question is with the reverse waiver, you're basically taking a decision away from a prosecutor and giving it to a judge. We have, I think, 20 elected state attorneys in the state and we have hundreds of circuit court judges in the state. So in my view of this reverse waiver, it's not going to uh, result in more uniformity of kids being treated the same. It's probably gonna result in similar kids being treated differently even within the same circuit. In Hillsborough County, we have gosh, what, 9, 10, 11, 12 circuit court judges. If you bring the same uh, case in front of those judges, you're gonna get several different um, decisions. Uh, the way that it works in our office is all of these decisions are reviewed in order to try to have a consistent um, criteria that we look at and we try to have all the information that we can. We do have a good relationship with the public defender's office in our circuit where we share information and we look at information in that 21 day period that we have uh, when a juvenile um, is looking to be uh, potentially direct filed. And a representative Rusan also made a good point that the check on that is the electorate process and looking at the elected state attorneys and if uh, people in our circuits don't like the kind of decisions that their state attorneys are making, then that is their remedy. So that's why um, I'm in favor of the current law as it is and not changing it, especially to add uh, the reverse waiver. The other point um, that I want to make is the state of our law currently does allow judges when a child is direct filed under any of the statutory ways that, that he or she can be direct filed. A judge still has the ultimate discretion to even sentence that child to juvenile sanctions. So let's take a kid that's direct filed um, and he goes into adult court and the judge after the child is found guilty either by a plea or by a trial, the judge can impose juvenile sanctions, the same types of sanctions that a judge in juvenile court can impose. So the way that the law is currently without any changes, if a judge finds based upon information from the facts of the case itself or from information from the defense attorney at a sentencing hearing that juvenile sanctions are appropriate for that particular kid, um, that is still a perfectly legal um, sentence to impose on the child. So that's another reason why it's my position that the, that the law, the way it is currently, um, is acceptable and should not be changed. And okay. if I could make just one other point. Sure, go ahead. Um, Ms. Holt had indicated that these proposed bills do not take away um, the prosecutor's ability to charge. And I think that, not to get too specific about the bills, but the House bill, right now, um, prosecutors throughout the state of Florida have the discretion to charge for example, a 16-year-old child as an adult uh, for any felony. That is taken away by both of these bills. But the Senate bill and specifically um, curtails the ability of a prosecutor to charge 14 and 15-year-olds um, with any felony or enumerated felonies, violent felonies such as robbery, armed robbery, um, armed burglary, those kinds of things. The only uh, time that a 14 or 15 year old, I think, I don't want to misspeak, yes, can be charged as an adult under the Senate bill is for murder, manslaughter, or certain rapes. So if a 14 or 15 year old shoots someone in my community, I will not have the ability to direct file that child unless the victim dies. Um, that is a very significant uh, restriction on a uh, prosecutorial discretion in the state of Florida. You asked the point about actual practice and yes, experience in that. And Ms. Holcomb makes a, a, a point about the judge having the ability to sentence back even after a conviction. But the practical reality is that that rarely happens. In fact, many judges will not second guess the prosecutorial discretion of direct file and override that, they're going to give an adult sanction. And we know that. So what we wanted to do was create the check and balance on the front end 
before it gets to the judge. And what does that do, Representative Roussan, to a juvenile and maybe their their history, their record, and that type of thing? Well, look, let's, let's, let's just talk real. Can we talk real for a minute? Yes, we can. Let's okay. talk real. So yesterday, I go visit the Shady Side, mm -hmm. which is a gang on the south side of St. Pete in the Child's Park area. And when I walk up, these 14, 15 guys out there studied me from head to toe while I was walking towards them. But I had just been to Harbordale and talked to some of the gang members in Harbordale. And what one of the things they said to me is once they get a felony, their life is over. Right, okay. There is no more hope about a job or about this. This is why it's so important when prosecutors are making this discretion to direct file an adult court for crimes that are being committed, some of which are nonviolent crimes, uh, we have to consider the impact and the effect on that child and their outlook on a future life. These kids, they want a chance again. And what this bill seeks to do is bring some balance to that. There's a disconnect between the community and the perception of what when justice is being done. Now, the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about, but I'm going to mention it, I don't know that there's ever been an African-American state attorney in the history of the state of Florida. I know that there hasn't been in the, in the Sixth Circuit, probably hasn't been in the Thirteenth Circuit. And there are people who perceive that direct file is more disproportionate to African-American and Hispanic males than it is to their white counterparts. Ms. Holt, talk a little bit about the disparity, and, and Ms. Newcomb had talked about um, the disparity, and actually it would be more disparity if you allow the judges to uh, you know, participate or make that discretion in terms of direct filing a juvenile. But talk a little bit about the disparity and also what you think the implications are on a juvenile that's direct filed in adult court and also their um, success in well, life. Well, uh, that's a, you know it's, you're bringing up a great question, uh, Ms. Tatum, because here's here's the reality: with a reverse waiver hearing, what that means is the state attorney is going to put on their evidence in their case. The defense is going to do the same on behalf of the child. That means that there's an official court record. The decisions that are made by the judge will become a part of any appellate any appellate record for the future. As lawyers, we'll be creating a new body of law, which means that disparity will in fact be better checked. Because once you have judicial decisions being made on the record and case law being created as a result of that, you start getting parameters for what the courts are saying is appropriate in terms of the child, in terms of the case, and in terms of what a judge might be doing. So I would suggest that it enhances the opportunities to reduce disparity, just the opposite of, of what Ms. Megan seems to feel. Now, under, under, under the judicial waiver part that was occurring in the 1980s, you still were creating a body of law, but life has changed. What we now have with brain science and with all types of experts that are available to us because of the substantial amount of litigation that has gone on in this juvenile area, where juveniles have been treated in adults is, is outstanding. So you're gonna see a lot better body of law created and, and I think it will have a positive impact in reducing the disparity. Mm -hmm. The other thing that it's important for us to recognize is exactly what Representative Roussan says. Once someone makes a decision, and that's the prosecutor, makes a decision to place someone in the, in the adult system, there's a subliminal message being sent to the, uh, to the adult uh, judge, the adult court judge, and that is that this is a bad, bad person. And you know, frankly, sometimes it's a first time offender. Sometimes it's for nonviolent offenses. Mm -hmm. I believe that the numbers across the state of Florida reflect that it's a 60-40 split between violent and not violent people. And it's nonviolent on the 60%. So, so it's very important for us to recognize that we're not talking about the worst of the worst of the worst. There are other, other types of cases that are caught up in this, in this system. I think that's extremely important. And I think that it has been clearly shown that the disparity based on, on socioeconomic and, and racially, I think it's been clearly shown that there is a disproportionate amount of African American and Hispanic children coming into the system. Representative Roussan is African American, I happen to be Hispanic. Uh, there's a sensitivity there on my part that that's my job. My job is to try and figure out why those things are happening. And 
Um, I may have, and again, I know we're not trying to get into details of the bill in tremendous amount, but there's a substantial number of enumerated offenses, more than three, where 14 and 15 year olds can be direct filed. One of them is may. Uh, what, what we're talking about is there isn't any more of this you shall. I, I find it interesting that the legislature is, if you think about it, and, and the public defenders are in favor of this, the legislature's not going to mandate that you shall direct file against someone. Frankly, there's going to be broader discretion for the state attorneys. The list is changing a little bit in terms of what types of offenses. What we're saying is clearly we have a substantial number of years and a lot of statistics. Juvenile reform is appropriate now because of all the unintended consequences. And let's be honest. If you, if you take a look at what the electorate does or does not do, when it comes to the state attorney and public defender types of races, we are at the bottom, we are at the bottom of any type of ballot that exists. And it has been clearly shown that the lower in the ballot that you go, the less that the electorate is voting in those races. And we don't have contested elections for a year or two years like the presidency where you get to really know people. Um, Juvenile direct file. It doesn't sound like a lot when you say, oh, there was only, th there were 300 kids that were juvenile direct filed into the adult system. That doesn't sound like a lot to the electorate, but it is a lot in the criminal justice system. It is a lot of kids, and we know that we're losing them. It impacts their ability to work, their ability to get scholarships, their ability to go to colleges, their ability to go into the military. Those are all important things. We cannot lose a generation of children in any way because we've made this decision. And discretion is a wonderful thing, but checks and balances are a part of what we've always intended in the criminal justice system. So again, a second set of eyes looking at something can never be bad, in my opinion. Yeah, okay, so nothing is yeah. construed that we're attacking the professionalism or the lack thereof on the part of Ms. Megan Holcomb or the good prosecutors and judges who work hard in this system every day of the week. Uh, to seek justice, and I, and I hope you. Thank you, it's Megan Newcomb. Newcomb, so sorry, representative. Said, thank oh. you. It's okay, um, and I appreciate that. And I and I don't think I don't take your comments or Ms. Holt's comments um, to criticize me personally or my office. Um, certainly, um, one of the factors that my office does not consider when making a decision is the race of the juvenile defendant or the race of the victim or of any of the witnesses. So I didn't expect that you all were. Um, hopefully that you weren't criticizing our professionalism. I do want to say um, that I do agree that there needs to be juvenile justice reform. I think we all can agree on that. I think we can agree that children are different. Um, children who commit crimes um, are different from adults who commit crimes. What my concern with this bill is, is I think you have a solution looking for a problem. I don't necessarily see the correlation between juvenile justice reform and direct filing of juveniles throughout the state of Florida as being the problem. What I would like to see is a analysis and um, examination of the juvenile justice system as it exists today. We're talking about things like when juveniles are arrested, they can only be detained in detention for 21 days, and then they're released um, unless they're direct filed. So that's a concern that I have as a prosecutor uh, when Ms. Holt talks about us having a time crunch as to make a decision to direct file a child. Part of my um, decision-making process is, am I gonna put a juvenile back on the street who continues to commit crimes over and over and over again every 21, 31 days? Um, and some of these kids are being used, frankly, uh, by adult criminals uh, to carry their guns and to commit their crimes because they know that the juvenile justice system as it currently is, um, is not effective in rehabilitating a lot of these kids. And these kids will come in and do their 21 days and go right back out and commit another crime because that's the atmosphere that they're living in. So sometimes direct filing them is actually uh, stopping them from committing additional felonies that could uh, put them in prison a lot sooner than they should be. So I agree that the juvenile justice system certainly needs to be reformed. And I would really welcome a close look at um, the Department of Juvenile Justice and their uh, commitment programs that are good, but they could be longer, they could be more effective, they could be utilized better. This whole 21 day uh, rule is very difficult for us to operate under. Um, the, one of the okay. differences between the House and the Senate bill is the House bill allows for blended sentences um, for the judges, which I think is an excellent 
um, idea. Um, so that's my position regarding juvenile justice reform. Okay, very good. So Representative, one last question um, for you. As, as you are up there in Tallahassee and seeing this bill go through the process, what next in terms of, just very quickly, what next in terms of is there a possibility to get the reverse waiver um, portion back in the House bill? And um, and just very quickly, how do you see that happening, if that is well, if that should happen? The first thing I want to say is the next thing that should happen is we need to equitably fund public defenders' offices and we need to pay our state attorneys and public defenders more money. Please, Governor, help here, us here. find that in the budget. Here, here. Uh, I don't think anyone will, will object, <laughs> object to that, Representative Roussan. Exactly. What, and what should happen? Probation officers, too. And probation, and probation officers, officers, the whole, yes, what should criminal happen justice after system. That is, it's never over till it's over. Uh, just because the uh, amendment was made on the bill in this committee doesn't mean it will, it's dead forever. Uh, things find a way of resurrecting themselves in the procedural process of the House and the Senate and in conference when sometimes bills pass out a little differently and then we have to confer and pull together and, and make it one bill at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm not discouraged by it coming out. Uh, it's still moving in the Senate with it in it. And frankly, the Senate bill could come over to the House and be laid down in place of the House bill at some point during session. So there, there's still an opportunity. Okay, excellent. We are so glad to have our guest here who just did an excellent job informing us and informing all of those in the community, the Tampa Bay area and actually all around the state of Florida about SHB 129 as well as SB 0314. Thank you so much for being with us today, and uh, maybe we'll have a wrap-up to this in the future when we see how everything has turned out. And uh, God bless, and we hope to see you as our viewers again on Flor Florida You Judge as we continue to talk about the important issues that concern us today. Thank you very much, and see you soon. This is your host, Nina Hayton, on Florida You Judge.